Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining me for another session of poetry readings and some comments about the poets and the poems. Last week, we focused on poets of the Great War, meaning World War I, but I don't think we gave that era the attention it deserves. It was an abrupt transition from the Romantic era of the 19th century and the Victorian era to the more gritty realism needed to write about the war. The transition started in 1914 and 1915 when early in the war, patriotism was the big thing. But by 1916, when the awful realities of trench warfare were realized, the poetry changed the pace. We'll start with a poem by Rupert Brooke. We didn't have him uh, last time, but he was the romantic ideal of a poet, rich, well-educated, and good-looking, with a shock of wavy hair. He and his family knew just about everyone in literary England. He died young, and here are a few comments about the last year or so. Um, uh, he was, he was uh, called by one of his biographers, um, it, he was the golden-haired, blue-eyed English Adonis. <laughs> you couldn't get any better than that. Um, and the people who lauded him after his untimely death were writers Virginia Woolf and Henry James, and British statesman Winston Churchill. In the decades after World War I, however, critics reacted against the Brook legend by calling his verse foolishly naive and sentimental. Despite such extreme opinions, most contemporary observers agree that Brook, though only a minor poet, I'm not so sure about that, occupies a secure place in English lit as a representative of the mood and character of England at the onset of World War I? Well, perhaps, but huh, I'm not going to let you dangle any longer. I'm actually going to read you uh, a poem by Rupert Brooke. This is one of four sonnets that he wrote early in the war. <clears throat> And uh, this is the most famous one. It's called The Soldier. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England bore, shaped, and made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam, a body of England's breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of home. And think, this heart, all evil shed away, a pulse in the eternal mind, no less, gives somewhere back the thoughts by England given, her sights and sounds, Dreams happy as her day, and laughter learnt of friends, and gentleness in hearts at peace under an English heaven. <clears throat> well, um, this sonnet with 14 lines is not a traditional Shakespearean sonnet. It does not end with a rhyming couplet. The rhyme scheme is different. I won't have time to go into the technical details, but it is widely available on the internet and you can see it there. Next, we're going to go to a woman poet, contemporary to uh, Rupert Brooke, named Jessie Pope, no relative of the famous Alexander Pope, of an earlier century, and she had a completely different British audience. 
She wrote for numerous newspapers, and she wrote many, many uh, poems and articles for Punch, the humor magazine. Um, we can describe her as an early feminist because of many beliefs that she held. And <clears throat> here is her contribution. I'm only going to read the first of the two uh, stanzas of this poem. War Girls by Jesse Pope. There's a girl who clips your ticket for the train and the girl who speeds the lift from floor to floor. There's a girl who does a milk round in the rain and the girl who calls for orders at your door. Strong, sensible, and fit. They're out to show their grit and tackle jobs with energy and knack, no longer caged and penned up. They're going to keep their end up till the khaki soldier boys come marching back. And then she goes on with a list of other uh, women who are volunteering to do important jobs where there's no men left to do them. Um, like the butcher girl who brings your joint of meat, et cetera, et cetera. Well, um, this is perhaps not very good poetry. Um, I think we have to admit that. <clears throat> um, and and uh, the uh, serious critics have sort of vilified her as a jingoistic doggerel writer. She continued writing after the war and eventually turned to children's books. She died in 1941, early in World War II. But during her heyday, she had a huge audience in uh, England. And I think we have to say that um, not everybody was <laughs> trained to read and think about poetry uh, at uh, Oxford and Cambridge, after all. Um, so she was sort of like the uh, English Edgar Guest, only a better poet than he. Um, and um, so that's the story about War Girls and Jesse Pope. Now, I'm going to turn my attention to Siegfried Sassoon. Siegfried Sassoon was perhaps the most authentic, along with Wilfred Owen, of the Great War English poets. The fact that I couldn't fit him in last time, I don't know why, why I didn't, is one of the main reasons for continuing this series. He was a wealthy country gentleman, um, interested mainly in poetry and fox hunting before the war. His family was uh, originally Jewish and was sometimes called the Rothschilds of the East because they made their fortune trading in India. His own father was Jewish and his mother was Christian. Late in life, he converted to Catholicism, but he didn't bring much sectarianism into his writing, if any. The war eventually made him a pacifist. He was wounded in the war and also got a military cross medal for rescuing a wounded soldier from the battlefield. And he himself survived the war, and he survived possible um, being kicked out of the military uh, by court-martial for some of his um, sayings and opinions printed in the press. But he had enough friends such as Bertrand Russell and Robert Graves, to get him uh, sent off to a hospital instead of being court-martialed. And 
And he did finish the war, and he did um, and survive the threat of court-martial. <clears throat> Let me just read you <clears throat> a little bit about <clears throat> the public reaction to his poetry. It was fierce. Some readers complained that the poet displayed little patriotism, while others found his shockingly realistic depiction of the war to be too extreme. Even pacifist friends complained about the violence and graphic detail in his work. But the British public knew he was right, and they bought the books that he wrote, because in his best poems, Sassoon captured the feeling of trench warfare and the weariness of British soldiers for a war that seemed never to end. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to read a poem of his called Dreamers, Dreamers, by Siegfried Sassoon. Soldiers are citizens of death's gray land, drawing no dividend from time's tomorrows. In the great hour of destiny they stand each with his feuds and jealousies and sorrows. Soldiers are sworn to action. They must win some flaming final climax with their lives. Soldiers are dreamers. When the guns begin, they think of firelit homes, clean beds, and wives. I see them in foul dugouts gnawed by rats and in the ruined trenches lashed with rain, dreaming of things they did with balls and bats and mocked by hopeless longing to regain bank holidays and picture shows and spats and going to the office in the train. Well, that's a powerful sonnet, if there ever was one. And um, I think we can say of Siegfried Sassoon that he probably wrote better about the reality of war than any of the other poets of his era. <clears throat> um, and it's um, um, uh, th there's a commentary I want to read you a little from this commentary um, about his poetry after the war S S uh, Sassoon became involved in politics lectured on pacifism and continued to write his most successful works of this period were his trilogy of autobiographical novels, mainly, <clears throat> and, and they were entitled The Memoirs of George Shurston, but they were really his own autobiography, and it was only thinly veiled or thinly uh, uh, disguised. And I haven't read those books, but they are going to be on my reading list for the near future. Now, I want to move on and read two poems by women poets of the Great War. These last are much better than the doggerel of Jesse Pope. I think you'll agree. The first is by uh, Vera Mary Britton, and her name Britton has two T's in it, if you want to look her up. <clears throat> um, the first one is called Roundel, and the epigram is a quote from a newspaper, Died of Wounds. Because you died... I shall not rest again, 
but wander ever through the lone world wide, seeking the shadow of a dream grown vain because you died. I shall spend brief and idle hours beside the many lesser loves that still remain, but find in none my triumph and my pride. And disillusion's slow corroding stain will creep upon each quest, but newly tried, for every striving now shall nothing gain because you died. Now that poem is a roundel, or sometimes called rondel. It's, it's another French form, like the villanelles we have seen before. These forms adapt well to English. This poem attempts to gather up the common feeling of emptiness that many British women felt at the death of their husbands, or sons, or grandsons, or lovers in the war. And the next such lady poet is one who had a very successful career as a writer of novels also. Her name was May Wedderburn Cannon, and Cannon here is spelled with two N's, C-A-N-N-A-N, -N -N, if you want to look her up. Um, and um, let me find this poem. Here it is. After the War by May um, Wedderburn Cannon. After the war, perhaps I'll sit again out on the terrace where I sat with you and see the change of the sky and hills beat blue and live an afternoon of summer through. I shall remember then and sad at heart for the lost day of happiness we knew. Wish only that some other man were you and spoke my name as once you used to do. I think that, and it's made the other poem by Mary Britton, um, are very, very sad, but also very well written. And I don't, I don't think they're sentimental. And that's the thing that critics always uh, dive on. Um, and I don't, I don't really think that we should put them in that category. The common themes here are loss and the opposing metaphors from life before the loss. And they, both of these poets share that style and that clash of ideas. Okay, thanks for listening. I now feel more satisfied that I have perhaps given you a better feeling for the common theme of loss that permeates the poetry of the Great War. After these came the poems of T.S. Eliot and others in the 1930s, changed forever by the break from poetic romanticism of the mid-19th century. Tune in next week. I promise something very different. Be there. Bye now.